Welcome into the Untitled Film Project Podcast. We have another interview session episode for you today. There's a psychological thriller that's about to be released in the theaters with Daisy Ridley and Ben Mendelsohn starring in it. It's called The Marsh King's Daughter. And we have the author of the original book, The Marsh King's Daughter, with us today, Karen Dion. Karen, thank you so much for joining us. We really do appreciate your time. Well, thanks. These are interviews are a lot of fun. I look forward to hearing what you what you have to say. <laughs> well, it's about what you have to say, not us. Yeah. <laughs> I think Jim would agree with that. We, 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 we would be remiss if we did not at least tell the audience that uh, Bradford is not here because he got pulled into a meeting. So we're going to float without him. You're the expert here. What do people need to know about the Marsh King's daughter before they go see it in the theaters? Yeah, you know, it's a funny thing because I think it's fine knowing what the basic premise is, which is that the main character who is played by Daisy uh, Ridley in the present, her name is Helene in, in the book and in the movie, uh, she grows up very unusual situation. She grows up in a cabin surrounded by swamp or marsh in Michigan's Upper Peninsula wilderness. For her first years of her life, she sees no one except her mother and father. That's all. And it might seem like a grim life, but but she it's all she knows. She loves her life. She loves hunting and fishing and foraging because she's a little tomboy and she adores her father. And then she finds out through a combination of circumstances that her father kidnapped her mother when her mother was a teenager and hid her away. And she's the product of that crime. So, you know, knowing that much about the movie going in, I think viewers can get a better sense of what to expect from the film then. Karen, I'm really curious from somebody who uh, has created this, this world that Helena lives in uh, with your book, international bestseller. So many people have, you know, grabbed onto uh you know the the themes of of betrayal and trust and uh you know kind of this duality when you were approached or if you approached them not sure how this worked perhaps you can talk us through that but uh uh how does somebody who creates a story like you have with marsh king's daughter let go of it and trust it to somebody else's vision who's going to put pictures and and a different maybe vibe or feel than maybe what you put into it as a writer? Yeah, that's a great question. And so the way things happened for me was as I was writing the novel, I wasn't thinking movie at all. Some writers do have a character, you know, an actor in mind as they're writing their characters. I did not. So when my literary agent told me that uh, I had a film agent for the book and she would be looking to sell the film rights. I thought, literally, I thought, I guess it could be a movie. I just did not see it as a movie. So with that in mind, when Anonymous Content optioned the film rights, it was with the screenwriter who co-wrote The Revenant attached to write the screenplay. So it, it's kind of obvious. Here's me with with like zero experience, never even thought of it as a movie versus, you know, Mark L. Smith, who obviously a very talented screenwriter. Sure. I was more than happy to hand the project off to him. That said, my literary agent insisted that before we sign any paperwork, I have a conversation with him and uh, with his daughter, L. Smith, who, who ended up co-writing the screenplay, just to be sure we were on the same page and they saw the book the same way I did. And I thought the conversation went very well. I was I was very happy that, you know, what they saw as the heart of the story, which is this push pull relationship that Helena has with her father. And they saw it as psychological suspense. I was confident that, you know, whatever they did, they would would be would be lovely. Plus, you know, from, again, from my standpoint, they loved the book or they wouldn't have wanted to adapt it. And likewise, I know that Neil Berger, who directed it, you know, has read and loved the book. And I'm going to assume that most people associated with the project have. So I do feel like, you know, they bought the film rights. They wanted to bring this story to the screen. So, yes, do it in the way that you think is best is how I felt about it. Can you walk us through the emotions of that phone call or just what or maybe when the deal closes or however you want to you know, for dramatic purposes, tell the listeners the most <laughs> heightened part of the story. But, you know, like, I mean, you, know, you write this book, you're invested in these characters, obviously, you know, you put it out, that's a feat in and of itself. And then on top of that, then you get a phone call, you're like, hey, we're going to close the deal on this, you know, they're going to make it a movie. What is that like? 
Yeah, that was pretty awesome. And there were so many amazing moments along the way. So um, my agent told me that I had a film agent the same day that he sent the manuscript for The Marsh King's Daughter to editors to see if anybody wanted to publish it. And it ended up um, 12 publishers wanted to publish it. So we had, a, you know, a 12 way auction and that was very exciting. And that was just in the U.S. immediately after the Marsh King's Daughter book rights sold in a seven way auction in the U.K. and a five way auction in Germany and a three way auction in Korea and for a record amount in Poland. It's it's been translated in 28 languages around the world. So, you know, that was a pretty heady time. And just knowing that. I had a film agent uh, that was exciting, but it didn't really hit home until about a year later when I found out that anonymous content, you know, wanted to option it. I was actually at a, at a writer's conference and I was sitting, sitting next to my editor at a, at a dinner arranged by the publisher. And I'm sorry, I was checking my email <laughs> and I saw the email from my agent, you know, and I just kind of pushed the phone over next to, to my editor and grinned at him and he grinned back at me. And that was a very cool moment. When I'm, you know, watching the movie, I saw Helena as a very happy child and then a miserable adult after she's been rescued. And I was wondering if you could kind of talk us through uh, what was going inside the mind of Helena as she's trying to live this normal life, but she's, I guess, maybe never comfortable in this new life that she's in? Yeah. That the movie leaps over that transition, but in my novel, Helena does not have a good time of it when she leaves the marsh because there are so many things about the outside world that she doesn't know. And, and she actually hates her father. She goes from loving her father unconditionally to hating him, not so much for what he did to her mother, but because she knows nothing about technology and pop culture and social norms. She doesn't even know a ball bounces. Um, I gave her a stack of old National Geographic magazines in uh, the cabin where they're squatting so that she could learn to read and know something of the outside world. So her mother has pointed to a picture of a ball and said, named it for her, but she doesn't know how a ball acts. So you can imagine, you know, the weight of that on this, you know, teenage girl, she just, you know, it, it's not working. It's not working at all. And so in, in my novel, when she's 18, she's had enough of all of that notoriety. She changes her name. She changes her looks. She reinvents herself. She does not tell her husband as, as they start dating who she is. And of course the movie is true to that too. So um, she's hiding a big secret, you could say, and she's never fully let her husband into her life because she's hiding this big part of her past on who she is. So yes, in the movie, she is, is kind of miserable. She doesn't know where she belongs. Do you find that people that read the book are more likely to be like, I've got to go see it on screen or the opposite where you're like, I've saw it on the screen. Now I got to go buy the book and read it for myself. And I'll, 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 Give some color to this question. My wife is a reader and I'm a watcher, hence why I have a movie podcast. But, you know, like she, she reads a lot. And then but I'll go the opposite way. I'll say that was really good. I'm going to go read this now. And then she'll do the opposite way and say, no, no, no. I, I read this book. I got to go see what, you know, how they presented it in the film. Can you kind of like just in your own personal, maybe even your own life, like what way do you think people go more? Yeah, it's it's a funny thing because, you know, a, a book has a lot more in it than a movie can. You know, it's, it's many pages long and it takes many hours to read, Absolutely. whereas a movie goes by so quickly and it's so visual. So um, I think if people are, are, if they've read the book and they're a fan of the book and they go see the movie, I try to emphasize, if I have a chance, to, to clear your mind of the book and just enjoy what you see on the screen. It is my story. It's slightly different, yes, but if they get all hung up and what's different and what's missing, they're gonna they're gonna miss the movie too. <laughs> so they can do those comparisons and analysis later if that's what they want to do. And uh, yeah, but while they watch the movie, they should just put the book out of their minds and enjoy what they see on the screen. And of course, then I hope anyone who comes to the book after the movie, you know, will enjoy all these added parts and layers that are in the book. Okay, I'm going to put you on the spot, Karen, uh, as just Karen the person. 
and not the person involved in this film or, you know, the international bestseller. Uh, can you remember a time when you read a book and then went to go see the movie and then you said, wow, this doesn't match what I pictured in my imagination at all. And that's not to say that they did a bad job of it or anything, but we're, we're just really, these are so different. Yeah. You know, I, I truly have not had that experience. I have a few favorite movies and interestingly, I've never read the book. So like, I love Jurassic Park. Of course, I have read Jurassic Park, but you know, yeah, I think Michael Crichton, yeah, I think the movie's better. <laughs> I just love the dinosaurs <laughs> and seeing them. But, but, and then the Princess Bride, I know it's a book, but I love the movie and I don't want to read the book mm -hmm. because I love the movie so much. So that's a hard one for me to answer as far as that's concerned. Then now as the author of the book and, you know, the movie on which the book is based, having seen it. Um, yeah, there there are a lot of things that didn't make it into the movie. Um, I can't remember if I said this, but when I was talking with um, Mark L. Smith before uh, we signed any paperwork, he, of course, told me that he loved the book. He'd read it three times. He wouldn't be adapting it if, if he didn't love the book. But he told me he had marked an X on the scenes that had to stay. So, of course, that means that a lot of the scenes weren't going to be in the movie. And uh, but no, I, I think I honor and respect each medium for what it does. I'll, I'll use an example. There's a scene in the movie and you'll know which one I'm talking about if you've seen it, where Daisy goes from looking submissive to looking fierce in just just a flash, just like that. Yeah. I couldn't write that in a book. It would take too many words and too many paragraphs and the impact would be lost. So I think books have their strength. Movies have their strength. Um, if you enjoy both, that's great. But if you'd enjoy one or the other, that's okay too. <laughs> Excellent answer. A great answer. <laughs> we all are somewhere on that spectrum, but I love how you respect it both and come at it with different expectations. Exactly. And I love the fact you picked two phenomenal films. You know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, that was really great. We've been joined by award-winning author and, of course, author of The Marsh King's Daughter. Uh, Miss Dion, we cannot thank you enough for this. This has been a tremendous joy for us. We're very excited for people to see the film. Uh, we, we think it, it could be a sleeper hit. I don't even mean that as a as a, um, as a backhanded comment. I mean, that's, you know, everyone's talking about, you know, Taylor Swift right now and, like, you know, it's award season and all this. This is, this is a strong film that's worth attention, and I think you're going to get that. You're going to get a groundswell of of uh you know just buzz and just word of mouth if you will it's going to cut through all that noise and then hopefully for you personally you then see a residual effect where people go buy the book as well and be able to read that and really enjoy it that way as well yeah uh, thank you i i hope you're right I, I i agree it's it's a gorgeous film and i i'm really hoping it gets the attention it deserves it's a great sure. thriller and just, I mean, so suspenseful and uh, it's a great ride. So uh, thank you for creating it. Thank you for giving uh, us your time here on the Untitled Film Project podcast. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to the Untitled Film Project podcast. To support the show, please rate, review, follow, and subscribe. Original music by Jeremy Schwartz. Special thanks to the Music City Film Critics Association. Editing and post-production by Jeremy K. Gover. Voiceover by Chad Bennett.